morning. Welcome everybody. So good of you to be here. This is the official kickoff of the business marathon. And um, we already had a short primer last night with a lot of people here showing up. And uh, we had people from all over the world. So I want to hear first to start with the Dutch people. Are there Dutch people here? Let me hear you, Dutch people. Yes, all right. There you go. Then I want to see your hands if you're from outside of the Netherlands but still in Europe. Who is here? Yes, I met you. Oh, great, awesome. Right. I already saw see very familiar faces from yesterday night. Are there people here from outside of Europe? Please raise your hands. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Where are you from? India, welcome. And you? Brazil, another Brazilian. Wow, y you like nodding also from Brazil? Wow, it's a Brazilian invasion here. I like it a lot. It's great, great. Okay, so to get things started, the business marathon is going to be the experience. In a matter of two days, you have the opportunity to build your own startup. And it's not going to be as scary as it sounds, because we're going to guide you through the process. We have some amazing problems you can work on. You're going to use your creative skills, form a team, and in the end you have the opportunity to pitch in front of an audience and a very expert jury. And on Saturday night you're going to be have the opportunity, if you're in the final, to be on the main stage, to win a big prize and to be there in front of investors. So the agenda for today. We are going to introduce the business marathons a little bit more. We're going to tell you about the logistics and everything you need to know. Then we have some really great keynote speakers to introduce you to the theme of mobility and the theme of energy. And then we're going to, to separate between mobility and energy and move to the workspaces over there. And then you have the opportunity to pitch your idea. We're going to form teams and get you going. But first, I have to thank our fantastic sponsors. First, to start off with the Ministry of Economic Affairs. They are the big sponsor to make the whole campus party possible. Also, Utrecht region. And I have to mention here that there is a special delegation from the city council, from the municipality of Utrecht present right here. Please raise your hands. Yes, you are there. You're going to get a big applause in a minute. I also want to, to say thanks to Utrecht Science Park, CNO and Utrecht Inc. for the mobility challenge and Mitros for the energy challenge. Let's give them a big applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Then a little bit about me, so you have an idea who, who I am. I, uh, I studied computer science and economics as well, and I have uh, quite some experience uh, engineering software. And uh, I am a sort of an idealist. I want to build a better society. And I have a lot of ideas about that. And I don't want to do that by going into politics or just writing books about it, but I want to do something. That's why it's called I'm a social entrepreneur and a pragmatic idealist. Uh, I have my own startup. We develop open source products in energy, so I can tell you also a lot about energy and uh, in health. And I've done, this is my 16th uh, hackathon actually, and uh, a lot of the participations, I won some prizes, and now I'm here uh, on the stage for you. But you're the lucky ones because you get to, to really do it. Uh, Dwight? Where is yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Hi Go everyone, ahead. welcome to the business marathon. You guys are all feeling e excited, enthusiastic, and ready to go. Can I hear some noise? Who's excited? Woo! You all made it. Congratulations for being here on time at 11 a.m. on a Thursday morning. That is a challenge uh, complete f for the first case. Uh, so, as Diederik said and uh, and introduced himself, uh, we're both super passionate about these topics. Uh, in my case, it's mobility. Uh, I did have a mobility startup at one point in time. I'm looking forward to sharing some uh, lessons learned uh, through that experience uh, with many people, many of you who are interested in mobi mobility through the next few days. Uh, my background, I'm Australian, as you may have guessed from the accent. Uh, I've lived now in the Netherlands for a few years. Uh, I've experienced the, the sort of fantastic transportation infrastructure that we have here, but I also see a lot of the challenges. Uh, and like yourselves who have come in from other countries and cities around the world, I'm a pretty avid traveler. Uh, so it's sort of front of mind for me how much uh, of a challenge mobility is to cities, towns, regions all across the planet. So I'm really excited to, to meet a lot of you 
work with a lot of you through the next few days to, uh, to look at how we solve mobility challenges for our generation and generations to come. So I want to introduce a, a little bit more these business marathons and, and what they're all about. So we're working over the next few days. Uh, there'll be some more details about how that actually happens in a moment. But to start off with, I just want to sort of set the scene for you. The business marathon is all about solving big problems. There's a lot of different challenges happening around the campus party. Uh, sorry, yeah, the campus party. And what is different about the business marathon is that this one goes through right from this morning through till Saturday evening. Uh, this is a really key part of the entire campus party and you're all here at the beginning so you've got a great chance uh, at working through the next few days to ha make a big difference. Get up in front of possibly uh, make it through to the final to get up in front of everybody on Saturday evening and share your idea, share your solution to one of these two challenges in front of an awesome audience in front of a, an all-star jury of judges. So we're judging on a set of criteria that we'll go through in a moment and you'll have the chance to win a huge prize. So that's the business marathon. It's all about big problems, big challenges, your creativity, your inspiration and your solutions. So let's look a little bit more at mobility. As I said, I've seen the awesome infrastructure that we have here in the Netherlands, yet there's still big challenges. There's still things that don't work quite the way they should, uh, and that applies to, to cities everywhere around the world. In the, in the case of the Netherlands, and in particular here where we are in Utrecht, who's from Utrecht actually? Awesome, about nearly half, which is good. I think we're gonna have more people come in through the day uh, and, and get involved, and I'm sure they'll be going to be interested to hear about the challenge that we have here in, in Utrecht. Uh, and in particular, there's the case of the Utrecht Science Park which is this amazing facility and precinct where there's so much happening. Uh, there's, univer there's a university, there's a hospital, there's a whole bunch of private organizations, and there's big traffic jams. And as awesome as it is, it needs a little help, and it needs the creative thinking of folks like, uh, you, like you in the room to figure out new and innovative ways to overcome that challenge. Uh, and then also those, cha those solutions can be applied to other places around the world. So we're really excited about uh, mobility. Who here has got an interest in mobility or some sort of like interest and experience? Who's thinking they might want to join the mobility challenge? Can I see a hand? One, two? <laughs> yeah, we've got some of you interested. We're basically, we're going to split up in a moment and we're going to head off and we're going to talk about some ideas. We're going to pitch some ideas and we get this thing going. But that's my little introduction on mo mobility. I want to hand it back to Diederik to talk yes. more about energy. Energy, yes. There you go. So, um, I'm sure you all know that we're sort of in a transformation going from fossil fuels to renewable energy. I mean, that should be not nothing new. But right now we are in a very unique moment in time where um, renewable energy becomes cheaper than fossil fuels in a lot of places. So that means we are going from the experiments and the technology that has been developed locally, some people have solar panels, there's some wind energy going on here and there, um, to really scaling things up. We really are in a point to, to move to the next boundary. And the energy challenge is going to be all about that. You have a lot of experts here who know what's going on. For example, in Utrecht, the challenges that are there of renovating and retrofitting existing buildings and houses to become energy producers. How do you do that? How do you get this behavioral change that the building owners and the lenders want to do that, and also the grid infrastructure. Because with the renewable energy, you're going from central uh, production to decentral production. So at any moment in time, you need to coordinate who's producing what, where, where is energy needed, and these flows have to be co coordinated. This is the smart energy grid. So if you're interested in working on some real world problems, to apply your creative skill to that and to see what you come up with to scale it to the rest of the world, the energy challenge is for you. And now Dwight is going to talk us a little bit more through, uh, yeah, you, uh, there you are, man. I lost you. <laughs> there you go. All right. Okay, so I'll take you through what is actually going to happen through this weekend or this uh, next few days right now into the weekend uh, and the, the business marathons. So we're starting this morning. This is the kickoff. 
in a few moments, we're going to have a couple of awesome speakers and insp inspiration for you about these two challenges uh, and the topics of mobility and in energy. Then we're going to kick it over to you. We're going to get you to pitch your ideas. We're going to brainstorm a little bit about what the, what the challenge involves and what ideas we could tackle. We're going to pitch 60 seconds. Then we're going to go through this interesting process of voting and forming teams uh, and getting started to actually work on solving the problem. This event, the Business Marathon, is really all about action, getting things done. So as you can see, we start off by understanding the problem that we're looking to solve. We've got some workshops uh, this afternoon that we'll dive in further. We're going to help you. We're going to work with you along, uh, alongside a bunch of experts on the business side about how to create sustainable, scalable, and viable businesses. Uh, we also have experts around data, around the technologies that are relevant to these two particular uh, topics. As we work through the weekend, we're thinking that... Yeah, it's, uh, I, it's, the, it's the week. Yeah, the week. I have to excuse Dwight because <laughs> he's done 25 startup weekends, <laughs> so that's always a weekend. So sometimes you'll hear him saying, through the weekend, and you get to pitch on Sunday night. We have to forgive him for that, okay? Yeah, yeah. it's a little bit <laughs> deeply ingrained in the, in the brain, I'm afraid. But in any case, <laughs> we're working together. We're having fun. Uh, we will be focused on the business side. So how scalable and sustainable is, your, is the business model backing up the solution that you've come up with? Uh, and then also on the product side, what have you been able to build? So do we have a prototype? Do we have some nice concepts, some concept drawings, uh, and some prototype that explains and, and demonstrates how uh, how your solution will work. From there, we go into, as I said, building and final presentations on Saturday. But I want to kick it back a little bit now and ask you lot, everybody in the audience, why are you here today? What has brought you to the campus party? Can I ask, has anybody got a, a quick sort of idea of why you're here? Or is there somebody over here? Can I ask you why are you at the campus party? Yeah. <laughs> You're interested in challenges and things? What's happening? Yeah, I said electrical engineering, so I think it would be quite awesome to be here. It's my first time, and yeah. Awesome. Anybody else? Who else has got a got something interesting to tell us about why they're here at the campus party and the business marathon? Uh, I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, I normally attend events where there is learning, especially when there is when I where I can put in my skills uh, into practice. Awesome. Um, Anybody else? Can I get one more person? No? Okay, that's all right. I've got a couple of things here that I think we often see at these style events. These are the sorts of things that by sticking with the group that you have in the room here this morning, by going the, doing the hard yards, by opening your eyes and your minds to new possibilities, uh, these are the sorts of things that can happen. You're going to have some fun for sure. Hopefully, is everybody having fun already? Having a good time? Awesome. Taking what, on what new chat. What was that? What was that? Yeah, come on. Yeah. I want to hear some noise. Let's get up and... Do you have fun? Let Are me hear you. Yeah. All right. Let's get the energy going. We've got to show the rest <laughs> of the hall here that this is the place to be. This is where it's at. So having fun. We're meeting awesome people. I've seen and already met two or three awesome people down here. Some of you were in last night as well. Loving it so far. There's going to be a whole lot more of that. So this is uh, the reasons to be here this morning. This is the reason to stick through the business marathon have a chance on Saturday evening to take home a nice little prize. Before we get there, just to give you an idea, we have a, a, a really nice program through the next couple of days. Uh, you can see this afternoon more detailed introductions to the challenges at 2 and 3 p.m. We have progress checkpoints through the whole uh, program, through the whole marathon, keeping you on track, helping you solve your challenges, your biggest um, concerns and risks. And then Saturday, f semi-final presentations and final presentations. So this is your chance to, to shine. How we do this and why we're doing this, uh, I think I've covered. But then we've got some details about what we expect to see at the end and what we really hope to see from the solutions that you come up with. So I'd like to pass it over to Dieterich yeah, to sure. give the judging criteria really yeah. quickly. Yeah. Maybe it's good also to mention that we're applying like the just-in-time information strategy. So we're not overloading you right now with everything. So this is by far not everything that you're going to get. So just give you bits and pieces 
every time so you know what's go going on next. So to keep an eye on, as far as the judging criteria are, are concerned, I'm going to look at this. Potential Im for impact and value for society, product and business model viability, originality, user experience and design, learnings and insights gained from potential users and customers, and executions and progress towards launch. Any questions? Does that all make sense? Does that sound like an awesome challenge to have in front of you? We've got a question. I'll give you the mic. I'm curious because for some ideas that we have, it's quite hard to, to split between energy and, and mobility because sometimes tackling the mobility issue would actually solve the energy problem. So yes. at the end, when we have to choose which group follow, it would be a bit tricky, I would say. Did, did, did you have difficulty to choose? I mean, it's not That's difficult, not but the thing is, uh, there is like a main focus, but yes. it also solves a bit of yeah, the Yeah, it doesn't matter. Issues. It doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, the I think the most interesting things can be a combination of energy and mobility. In the end, we don't mind if you go off to that workspace or the workspace over there. In the end, it's all, all about the solution that you create. And if you can convince us you create an awesome solution that tackles both, uh, challenges? Sure, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, yeah, the w uh, what I wanted to, to say finally before we go to the keynote speakers is um, that you can win 2,500 euros with your team. That's a prize for mobility and also the prize for energy. So there are two main prizes on the stage on Saturday night. It's like the big prize. And the partners have also offered that to help you further along so that the, uh, the idea, the solution that you came up with doesn't fall off a cliff after Saturday, but that they offer the opportunity to talk to you and to continue working on it. So I think that's pretty awesome. Great, all right. So I think we've now got a pretty good picture of what's happening through the next few days. I need to ask a favor from everybody in the room. I just had a little message from one of my co-organizers. It sounds like there's a whole bunch of people sleeping still, or maybe they haven't quite found us over here. <laughs> So if, you, if you're here, you guys have been fantastic. Yeah. Can I suggest and really encourage you to send a message, drop a quick tweet maybe in your, in your buddy's message box, try and grab a few friends. We're going to start pitching. They've still got plenty of time to get down here and be part of the pitches in about 45 minutes and later on through the day as well. So we're not too strict about starting exactly on time with the teams and things like that. We wanna have an, a great pitch session in about half an hour. But if, you, if you're able to bring more people along through the uh, next couple of days, that's gonna be totally fine yeah. as well. It's all about action. It's about getting stuff done. And we wanna try and get things out of your way, solve the little challenges so that you guys can apply all of your enthusiasm and all of your great ideas and make as much progress towards solving these challenges as you can over the next few days. If you do that now, if you know people are, are kicking around or they're not sure what to do, inspire them to come here and be inspired along with you and make things happen. All right, that's enough right. for me about getting this whole thing rolling. I want to announce our first speaker. Uh, this is a very special guest, Floris de Gelder, the director of the Utrecht Science Park. Can we hear a huge round of applause for Floris, please?
Would you be in a car? set thank you for your patience and now i'd like to ask once again for a large round of applause campus party business marathon style for floris <laughs> ladies oh la la this was quite loud um ladies and gentlemen good morning um this morning i listened to the radio and there was one of maybe you on the radio radio already awake at nine o'clock he was the only one in this room and told he had a very bad night because his air mattress was leaking and then he went up again and already started thinking about this challenge. Well, maybe we will meet, uh, but I'm very happy that you are here and that more people have woken up in the past two and a half hours. And I would like to tell you briefly something about Utrecht Science Park. Um, and it was already told, Utrecht Science Park, it's about the university. It's about companies, small ones, large ones, and it's about hospitals, it's about curing people. And which actually it's the largest concentration of hospitals in our country. And I think our science park is, it's not there because of the buildings, but it's there because of the knowledge and the knowledge that helps us to cure people and to pe make people more happy and wealthy. And I have a little movie, it's a one minute movie to introduce one of the institutions that we have on our science park we call it the Princess Maxima Centrum, and it's being built today. It will open in 2017, 2018. Uh, this will be the largest children cancer hospital in Europe and one of the three largest in the world. And I have a little movie about this building that we are building. We started three months ago to give you an impression of something very special that's happening on our science park, and after that I will give you a little bit more information about the park itself. But first, I would like to show you this little movie. So, can you maybe even help us? Got it? Yeah, we'll get this going in just a moment, folks. Let me see. Eigenlijk is het eerste wat je ziet een tuin. Nou ja, dan moet je dus naar de balie waar je informatie kunt krijgen. En dan ga je naar boven, langs de school, waar je naartoe kunt als je langer in het ziekenhuis blijft. De trap hier, die is pas gaaf. Er is eigenlijk alleen een trap naar boven, want zo ga je naar beneden. Hoi, welkom. Nou ja, dan ga je naar je kamer. Hier krijg ik mijn chemo. Daar word ik altijd erg ziek van. Fijn dat papa of mama dan op mijn kamer kan blijven slapen. Nog een tuin, op het dak. Natuurlijk snap ik dat ik hier in het ziekenhuis ben. Ze zeggen dat hier zelfs een research center is. Knappe koeken bedenken hier nieuwe behandelingen voor mij. Als ik me fit voel, kan ik met andere kinderen spelen. Dus ja, natuurlijk zou ik liever thuis zijn. Maar als ik dan toch in een ziekenhuis moet zijn, dan vind ik het hier echt cool. Well, this was, I think, a very clear introduction. Um, and I have a couple of minutes left to tell you a little bit more about our Utrecht Science Park. And you see here this very beautiful picture. Um, it's from the south side. It's about three and a half kilometers from the place where we are. 
at this moment. And this is how it started. 55 years ago, our university um, got more and more students and they started building concrete buildings three kilometers from here, outside of the city. Nobody had ever heard about Science Park or campus. They were just building cheap, large buildings very fast. And now, 50 years later, this is what it looks like. Um, it's a very large area. It's the largest science park in this country. And of course, the Netherlands is a very small country. Um, but for this country, this is quite big. And even, I think, for Europe, this is a quite impressive science park. And I will um, show you some uh, figures. This is, it looks a little bit different than I expected, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I think some figures are very interesting, especially for the challenge that we will have this week. And it's about the growth of the employment in our science park. Every day we have 72,000 people visiting this science park, using only one big road and two very small ones, and one or two bus lines, and a couple of bicycle paths. And these 72,000 people are coming every day, and it's growing and growing. So in the next five years, we will have 5,000 more jobs in this area and 10,000 more students. So this is quite big, especially for this country. We have the busiest bus line in Western Europe. And we have, and I will show you some pictures about the bicycles, an impressive lot of bicycles. 500 meters from here, you will find the largest bicycle station, the largest bicycle stall in the world. It's being constructed today. So mobility in Utrecht is not only about cars, but it's also about bicycles, and it's also about public transport. And I hope that you will have some brilliant ideas to help us to keep this very special area accessible. Because it's uh, important for our students that they can find the university at the right time. It's important for the people who live there. We also have 3,000 students living on the campus, that they can reach the campus. And most important, it's necessary for the doctors and the patients to reach the hospitals that we have on our science park. And one of the hospitals I've just shown to you, and I think everybody will acknowledge how important it is that you can reach a hospital like this. Um, something, and I will something about employment. Um, I told you the science park, it started with the university. It's about knowledge. It's about bringing knowledge to society. It's not about making money, but it's about combining, using our knowledge with creating a very vital economy. And here you can see what happens to the economy when you have a successful science park. It started with our university. Today we have about 100 institutions on the science park, two universities, the academic hospital, the Princess Maxima Center, um, some 80 companies and 10 research institutions, and it's still growing and growing. And one example, and you've probably read it in the newspaper three days ago, this company, which is on our science park, um, they developed a new cancer treatment that was um, uh, accepted to the European market three days ago. This company started 15 years ago with two people on our science park, and today it's a 10 billion euro value company, one of the largest uh, biotech companies in Europe, which is also on our science park and growing very fast. This building doesn't exist yet. But by the end of next year, it will be opened, and the ground floor will be open to the public and to all entrepreneurs and everybody who wants to come in to share knowledge with this uh, company. I told you it's about university, it's about hospitals, it's about companies, it's about starting companies, but it's also about creating an atmosphere of friendship, of really sharing knowledge, sharing, like we do today, uh, each other's knowledge and enjoying uh, from learning from each other. And this is our campus party. Every once a year we have in the botanical garden of our science park our festival, it's our annual festival, and all the students and people working at the science park come there, people from the city come there, and our most famous uh, professors give open air lectures and tell the world what their knowledge can help and can do for the world. And for us this is very important because we strongly believe that bringing people together ha in a good atmosphere, in a beautiful atmosphere, really helps to create new knowledge and I hope that you will do something like this in this week like we've tried to do it in this festival also every year uh, in our science park. Um, last year, and we are very proud of this, uh, many of my colleagues all over, over the world send me SMS messages and emails and when they saw 
the Grand Epare of the Tour de France on our science park. We had helicopters five hours during the day filming our science park and telling our story. It was really nice. Something about mobility, uh, to give you an impression of what's happening. Um, you see the 70,000 people coming in every day on the left. And if everything that we're doing is successful, and of course you, nev you never know exactly, but we see already that the park is growing very fast, then the number of people that's coming into the park will grow very, very fast in the next time. And I hope that with some creativity you can help us to make it possible to bring all these people into this very vibrant and wonderful area. It's only 15 minutes by bus or by bicycle from here. So if you have had a lot of sitting inside the building and need some fresh air, don't hesitate. You have some 72 hours to go. And if you only have one hour left, you can get an impression of the science park. So feel free to visit it. Um, this is a little picture. I <coughs> it was the day before uh, yesterday. And it gives an impression of what happens with car traffic at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, these are, you see all the roads in the neighborhood and on the science park itself. And you see a very, very, very tiny little bit of green. That's the roads where you can still drive. And then you see the orange, which is driving very, very, very slowly. And then you see the red, which is a traffic jam. And this is what's happening uh, many days around and on our science park, which ask for asks for a solution. Uh, and the solution is, is not only uh, getting people out of cars, which is, of course, very important, but this gives you an impression in comparable areas in the Netherlands, 70% of the people go to their job using a car. And on our science park, it's only 30%. So we were already very successful in bringing people into the bus, into public transport or using bicycles, but we still have a problem managing our growth. Well, this is a typical Dutch picture. This is what happens uh, when the police starts checking uh, traffic lights. So when our bis bicycles in the Netherlands, they always continue cycling. So they, when you have a red traffic light, they don't look at it, they just continue. And sometimes the police starts fining cyclists who go through a red light. And then in a couple of minutes, you have a traffic jam of kil kilometers of bicycles um, in the city center. So this is about two kilometers from here on the way to the science park. Um, this is another picture. If you choose to take the public transport, you see the buses here. It's like the, the metro in Tokyo that people have to be uh, pushed into these buses uh, to bring them to the science park. Of course, we are already doing something. This light rail connection doesn't exist yet, but two years from now, it will start uh, operating uh, from our central station to the science park. But we made some calculations that in 2018, this will start operating. And in 2020, it will already be full. So this is not just enough. Um, well, this was the last picture that I have. And I know one of my colleagues is coming this afternoon to give you a lot more of information, also figures and more information that you can really use to help us think about creative ways, innovative ways to keep our science park accessible. We are very proud of this science park. It's a beautiful area. And I'm very grateful that so many people from all over the Netherlands, but also the Europe and the world, came here today to help us to think about one of the most beautiful areas in this city in a creative and innovative way. Thank you very much, and I hope you will enjoy the days in Utrecht. Excellent. Thanks again, Floris. All right, so we've just heard a little talk, in fact, an excellent talk about mobility and how it affects the science park. I think you saw... You want me to... Yeah, you want to... Okay, sure. Hello, Seth. Yeah, hi. Okay, we're here. So um, I'm happy that Jorg took his own laptop. And uh, while I'm not going to introduce him just yet, I'm going to give him some time to set up. And uh, while he's doing that, I'm just going to introduce him for you. So uh, our next keynote speaker is Jorg van Heesbeen, a very nice Dutch name. He's from Jetlix. And Jetlix has created a platform for electric car yeah. charging. And as I understand, he worked for, he has been on an awesome ride with uh, his company. He also did things with or for Tesla. 
And uh, before I have to start making things up about him, I think he's ready to go. So give a big applause for Jorg. Thank you, Diederik. D do you Good need this one? Um, well, I think it's not connected to my MacBook now. No. <laughs> I'll figure it out. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a very honor to be here. Um, I actually graduated four years ago from the Utrecht Science Park. And uh, apparently people now in Vaden need to tell something about energy and mobility, because indeed those two worlds are connected. So uh, I work for Jetlix, going to tell you a l very little bit about what Jet Jetlix does. But um, what, I'm actually what I'm actually going to tell about today is what we see happening in the world of energy. What kind of breakthroughs do we see? Uh, but also, more importantly, what kind of challenges are there out there in the world of energy, uh, which we hope you will solve, uh, wh where you invent uh, yeah, some good uh, things to solve that. So first, jet lakes. So in a nutshell, what do you do? Well, we develop software for cars. Not the one you, will you found in Volkswagen last year, but we actually develop software for electric cars to connect them with uh, the energy market to make sure that we charge the car uh, with green and cheaper electricity, uh, which is basically uh, the best of both worlds. Uh, so help the integration of renewable energy, but also help to lower the cost uh, to charge your car, which is great. So we do that with Tesla and some others. And our application uh, actually was launched last month, so feel free to check it out. We could still use some uh, early adapters and uh, feedback. Um, Maybe you're wondering where does the name Jetlix come from? Well, we are not a uh, we're not related to Netflix or uh, it's not our parent company. No, Jetlix is af actually named after Mr. One second, Mr. Jetlick. He's the godfather of uh, electric mobility. He actually invented the uh, electromotor 100, uh, well, almost 200 years ago. So I think you were studying electro engineering. A have, have you actually heard of this guy? Well, 200 years ago, um, he was the first person who set current into an electric motor into motion, which is pretty cool. So we named our company after this guy. Um, so that's a little bit about Jetlix. And what our, what our company basically shows is that this is one of the many, many examples we see in our day that um, sustainability and renewable energy is not just for hobbyists, it's not just, doesn't need to be subsidized anymore, but is actually on par with fossil alternatives, which is really, really cool. So we are actually on the verge of a breakthrough towards renewable energy. And our app is just a very small example. Uh, this is actually a, a better and bigger example to, sh to prove that. So last month, Dubai, which has plenty of, uh, uh, plenty of uh, gas and oil uh, reserves uh, in their, in well, in it within their own borders or in the, in the area, they had a tender to, um, uh, they had a tender to, uh, to supply electricity to their, uh, for their country. And um, they d there weren't any subsidy at all, uh, but apparently uh, this huge solar field was more competitive than their locally produced uh, gas or coal or, uh, or oil to, uh, to, pr to produce electricity for the grid. So this, is, so this is really a huge breakthrough we see and uh, this is just the first example, but many, many more regions after Dubai will see that the cost, with the cost of solar coming down, will become more competitive. And I think we see a similar trend with electric vehicles. Within a few years with the Tesla Model 3, we see that, that, that those technologies and also wind energy will become on par with uh, their fossil alternatives, which is great. So I truly believe there's light at the end of the tunnel that we are really shifting towards renewable energy and that nobody can really stop this uh, thing from happening anymore which is very good, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, energy demand is still increasing. Global energy demand is still increasing. And uh, solar and wind sources are great, but they also have some challenges. 
So this is an example of uh, of ten days of uh, of ten days ago. So it was a nice sunny and windy afternoon in Germany uh, on the 15th of May, and this graph basically shows uh, how much uh, electricity is consumed in Germany and how much is produced by renewable sources. And uh, uh, this is this is not what you normally see in Germany, but Right now, there was a lot of wind and a lot of solar energy. Huh? During the day, you saw the solar popping up. And actually, on the Sunday, there was a little bit less demand. People were out sailing. I don't know what they were doing, going to the beach. And almost 80% was uh, supplied by renewable sources, which in general is good. But what happens at the same time, because there's such a, I would almost say, an oversupply of electricity, the, the price of electricity actually went negative, minus 35 so if you were the owner of a solar farm or a wind farm, you invested in these renewable sources, which is great, you actually had to pay to put the power on the grid, um, which is, I think, uh, is, is not good for the total cost of ownership of, uh, of wind and uh, renewable energy. And another challenge we see uh, with, uh, with those renewable sources is se seasonality. Uh, this graph shows how much uh, hours of solar there is during the year. As you can see, the Sahara, uh, the Saudi Desert, uh, uh, and the Mojave Desert, all places where they have a lot of, uh, a lot of hours of solar energy uh, per year. But the more north you go, uh, if you look to the Netherlands, Germany, Scandinavia, uh, the less hours of sun you have per year. Well, actually, the most energy in the Netherlands consumed is during the winter for space heating for, um, well, especially for space heating when it gets cold here. And th 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 this is particularly the moment when there's not a lot of solar energy available. Um, so a big challenge is how do we deal with this seasonal pattern of renewable sources, especially in areas uh, like Europe, like nor Northwest Europe, where um, yeah, where during the winter we don't have this backup. And um, another thing we see is that also with electric vehicles, is that if you have your own drive lane, which about 35% of the people do, if you have your own roof, it's very easy. Well, very, it's quite easy to shift towards uh, electric mobility and solar panels. But what do we do with these people? These people don't own their own roof. They probably also don't own their own parking spot. Uh, they have to share that with others. They share their roof with others. They have quite old buildings with already installations, uh, with already heating installation installed. So how do we shift those people? And I would say 70% of all the people in Western countries live in apartment blocks or at least shared spaces. How do we make sure that these people also sh shift towards renewable energy, can invest in that? And another challenge is that um, if we put a lot of wind energy or solar energy on, this, uh, on these roofs, uh, this is great when people are at home and using the energy, but sometimes they are at the office or they at the, at the industry where they work where there's also a lot of consumption. So th this requires a huge investment in the grid uh, because these distributed sources, which are competitive, also need require a lot of yeah, wires to make sure that, they're that, that they can transport energy to where it's needed. And well, last but not least, this is also uh, a big issue. If we're going towards uh, uh, electric mobility, which is nice, but uh, how, how, how do we deal with the fact that uh, uh, that parking spots are maybe shared with people who don't drive an electric car, and uh, uh, yeah, how do we deal with that? Because not everybody is driving an electric car right now, and uh, th the space we need for that is also uh, a huge uh, a huge uh, risk. So there was uh, there was my story. I will be here all afternoon. I can tell you a lot of things about the grid and about energy. And uh, as I said, I'm very excited about the future of renewable mobility, renewable energy. Uh, but uh, we cannot wait for 10 more years before uh, it gets uh, on par in areas like the Netherlands. So we need to hurry up uh, because the, the water level is rising. And 
uh, I hope that you come with, uh, with great inventions, with great ideas to support this. So looking forward to, to working with you. Uh, I will be at least there this afternoon uh, to, to answer all your questions, uh, whether it's about, uh, about Tesla or about renewable energy. And uh, looking forward to that. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions for now, feel free to ask them. Thank you very much. My name is Arvind Ten Dam from the Economic Board Utrecht. Can you please tell us a little bit about the Utrecht region uh, smart solar charging pilot? Because I know for sure that people really like that case. Yeah, this is actually a very good example. We're actually working together with, uh, with that project. So um, actually just, I think, 300 meters from here, uh, there's an area called Lombok. It's a very, very nice, lively area in Utrecht, and they put a lot of solar energy on the on the roofs of uh, of, of these uh, these houses. So uh, local people invested in solar and uh, were were quite fun to to do that. Uh, and they also invested a lot in public charging infrastructure. The, the local government, the economic board, and some local entrepreneurs they decided to, to team up and to put charging stations uh, in in uh, in the neighborhood. And uh, the project there, which is uh, which is a very good example of one of the one of these challenges we have. So the project there uh, is uh, called Smart Solar Charging, and what we do there is that we actually charge the cars in the area when there's a lot of solar energy. And the next step, what we're going to do is, if there is excess solar energy, uh, if we go back to this picture, if there's a moment like this when there's locally a lot of solar energy, and we actually see those those situations to happen. We try to charge the cars, but then in the afternoon, when uh, the sun is going down, we go to discharge the cars. So um, yeah, cars have batteries. These batteries can be used for for uh, not only for driving, but also for for the smart grid itself. So this is a very cool example where BYD, one of the largest, uh, uh, one of the largest manufacturers of electric cars, Renault and Nissan, uh, actually collaborate with the local government, with local entrepreneurs, also with Jetlakes. Our app will somewhere also be involved there. So this is a perfect example, and feel free to join me, and I could show you. I could actually show you the stations and the and the solar uh, the solar panels we are working with uh, yeah. around the corner. All right, Thank give you a very warm, much. Uh, warm applause for Jorach. Thank you so much. <laughs>